Um, and just in the interest of time, because I did invite John on for um, you know five or ten minutes to talk about cycling savvy, I'm gonna um, start with John's quick slide mm -hmm. to talk about what cycling savvy is. But before I do that, I just want to remind everyone that um, you know I'm here from Mass Bike. We do statewide bicycling advocacy, which is a lot of broader picture stuff, policies, funding, legislation, some of the big picture stuff. But my favorite part of the job is to work with individuals to break down barriers to get you riding. So I'm here um, in a much more personal capacity. So if you have any particular questions, any stories you'd like to share, um, I encourage folks to utilize the chat feature um, and then after the presentation to unmute themselves and we can actually go through and talk a little bit about some of the issues. Um, because this is the third in a five part series, we've actually been able to modify some of our presentations um, um, based off of comments, questions, and concerns that have come in. So I'm here for you, Adi's here for you. So remember that. Um, we are also here to present a lot of broad topics. Um, today's I wanna caution a little bit, there's gonna be a lot of discussion about riding in traffic and um, on bike skills on the roads. I wanna preface all this by saying that Though we have tips and tricks, and some of it might be new, um, nothing is necessarily gospel. We'll talk about the laws. Of course, there are laws, um, and there are principles of traffic, but everything is going to come down to your own um, sensibilities, your judgment, and the scenarios with which you are finding yourself. So though we'll talk about how to position yourself at an intersection, every intersection is different. Um, though we'll talk a little bit about riding in the winter, riding in the rain, um, every weather situation can be totally different. So um, everything that we're saying here is a guide point, but should influence your own decisions because I like to say this to my sixth graders when we teach them who is responsible for your safety, you're responsible for your safety. So I just wanna preface everything by saying that. Um, but I don't wanna scare anybody away. Today is gonna to be full of a lot of tips that will help you get riding. Um, and with that, I'm just gonna introduce John Allen. Let me just go to John's quick presentation here. Um, and John, I've known for years. Um, he uh, has been working with an organization called Cycling Savvy, which does classes and clinics um, related towards on bike skills. Um, and because, um, you know, typically it's for new cyclists or folks who are getting back on the bike after a while, I figured this would be a very good introduction for John to meet you all and to know that this resource is out here. Um, so with that, John, I'll ask you, um, I will go ahead and control the slides, but if we could do, you know, about five minutes of introduction to Cycling Savvy, um, and feel free to give a quick intro about yourself. Okay, let's see. Okay, very good. Everyone hears me, I think. Um, so uh, this is for seniors. Hey, I'm one myself. <laughs> and uh, it's great to be riding a bike at age 74 and uh, using it to get around town, also going on recreational rides. Um, my hope, and what, I, what I've been working on for a long time, years, decades, is to make that um, easier and safer for other people to do. So Cycling Savvy is an educational program. We have, we have courses involving classroom and, um, and uh, on-road sessions. Um, and uh, so I'd like to invite you to take that as well. I, I should also say I'm also a League of American Bicyclists instructor, as Galen is, um, but um, I'm teaching mostly in Cycling Savvy now. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we also, well, this is part of the classroom session where we have uh, really, I think, top quality graphics and show the different uh, different positions to use on the road. This is one example for left turn, uh, straight ahead and right turn. Um, in the presentation, um, we use in the classes, by Zoom, by the way, we're doing them in Zoom too. Uh, this is an animated graphic. Um, next slide, please. Um, so, gee. Mine went, uh, so, uh, okay. Um, we also talk about riding and sidewalks and crosswalks. This is not all about just riding on the road and, and on, on paths too. It's, it's not just because it's a path, it gets 
you know, nothing, nothing matters. Um, and we have, next slide please, um, parking lot sessions. This is one, this is a very interesting exercise where we realize how far you can lean the bicycle over in a turn um, before it skids out. So we do, it, do this safely um, with this demonstration here, the students do, and then we, then we practice quick turns, which can be very useful if the dog runs out in front of you or the car turns in front of you. Um, in, the quickest, safest way to get out of that situation is often to do a quick turn. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and then there's our on-road session um, where we practice uh, what you saw in that slide of the classroom session and a lot more, how to ride safely on the road. This is a tactic we use for riding in a group. You'll see the cyclists at the, real, at the rear are, have moved out into the next lane. And uh, this is something I only learned through Cycling Savvy, it, it, you know, the league program didn't have it, they probably do now, but that keeps a car from moving into the middle of the group and breaking it up as you change lanes. Uh, it's really cool. Next slide. Um, and so Cycling Savvy really, it's the, the road part of it is experiential and the, the goal of it is to get people safe with and, and confident with riding on the street and on paths um, wherever they ride, uh, except we do not cover um, mountain bike riding, um, riding on off-road and off-path trails. Uh, you could go to the New England Mountain Bike Association for that. Um, next slide. Um, this is, this is um, me giving a, a talk at one of our on-road sessions where I show uh, next slide, please. Um, show the path we take in getting from point A to point B. If, if you can see, maybe you can't see it quite clearly, but the red line is the route that we take um, and which lane to use to get in the correct position to make the next turn, how to get across the railroad tracks or trolley tracks, that's Beacon Street in Brookline in this picture. Um, and, and how to negotiate with the other traffic on the road. Next slide. Um, also, another resource I have, I, I'm a technical writer at SheldonBrown.com, um, which is a site on bicycle repair and maintenance and uh, has lots of useful information. If you want to work on your own bike or just get it fixed, you'll know what to ask the people at the bike shop. And um, we, we take questions. Um, you can communicate with us on our Facebook page or by email. Next slide, please. I'm author of Bicycling Street Smarts. This is the um, older edition uh, available through Rubel Bike Maps in Somerville. They sell this. And next slide. Um, this is the new Cycling Savvy edition available through cyclingsavvy.org, um, which is the organization that um, I'm running these courses through. Um, next slide. And this is just a, a page from it. This is the page showing how to mount uh, a bicycle when you start up, which surprisingly a lot of people never learn to do in the most efficient way. Uh, but that, this starts right out in Chapter 1. Um, next slide. So um, I encourage you to go to cyclingsavvy.org. We have um, an online session on November 6th you could sign up for. Uh, it's part of a three-part session, but if you sign up for that, you will be also able to take the... Uh, outdoor sessions in the spring um, here. That person who's teaching the session now is in North Carolina where it's a little warmer than it is now. We also have um, online sessions, a um, series of four classes, uh, each an hour long. 
um, in January and again in April. And I'll be running a three-part session uh, classroom, parking lot, and on-road in May uh, here in the Boston area. Open to run more of them if there's demand. Um, also recommend that you um, you could sign up with Galen for his courses. He you know he knows his stuff too. He teaches through the league program, um, and he can connect you with other league instructors as well. So that's my presentation, and thank you very much. Thank you, John. I really appreciate it. Um, so this was just a quick introduction. I, I thank you for the time. You're welcome to stick around for the rest of the presentation too, John. Um, I'll be here. Great. Excellent. Um, so yeah, so just some kind of highlights too. This is not just for older adults. Um, and yeah, so there are a couple of parallel tracks. So when we get riding again, I know this is a webinar series that we're um, doing five different distinct classes on. Um, hopefully we can all get riding together in the spring um, and there are some opportunities to touch base before then um, with AD at the Community Development Department, with myself at Mass Bike, with John at Cycling Savvy. So um, feel free to dig into some further resources so that once, um, you know, we're back in a little bit more of a COVID safe environment and uh, the weather turns good again, we can get out and ride. And I really appreciate a couple of points, John, that you mentioned. One was that you were drawing on a particular intersection diagram, because um, that will be reinforced with what we'll talk about in a second, how every intersection, especially in New England, has its own tips and tricks. So just keep that in mind. And it, sometimes it does take some distinct analysis of about how to maneuver safely. And that changes depending on the time of day, the weather, the traffic. Um, and then uh, another point that I really appreciated was the diagram on stopping and starting, or really, I guess was starting really. Um, that's a issue we covered last week. We used the video from the League of American Bicyclists, which is an okay resource, but um, you know, when we go and ride together, if we're gonna do parking lot drills, the first thing we teach is how to effectively get on the bike without wobbling, um, with getting momentum, with feeling like you've got confidence before you actually mount the bike and put your whole body weight on it. And so there's these little things that you might not even be thinking about, especially for an older adult, which might be more tricky, particularly getting on and off the bike. So I really appreciate that you highlighted that, John. And then um, thanks so much for the work that you're doing with Sheldon Brown's website, because that is actually, if you're a mechanic out there, um, or maybe you are an engineer in a past life to, uh, you can dive as deep as you need to into all sorts of bike mechanicry on the Sheldon Brown website. And these are all resources we'll send out um, through AD and the CDD after the fact. Cool. Um, I'm gonna jump into my presentation. And again, this is a lot of information. So feel free to pause me, ask me questions and AD, feel free to chime in at any point as well. Um, Cause I know that you know all this stuff just the same. Um, but today we're going to talk about tips for older adults for urban cycling basics. It's part three in our three part series. Um, we're going to be talking about multimodal options. We'll talk about clothing, inclement weather. We'll talk a little bit about locking up. Um, and then the bulk of the presentation is going to be about intersections, lane positioning, and how to avoid some um, serious crashes, which are not frequent, but do occur um, specifically, you know, drivers and vehicles of cars and bicyclists. So how to avoid some of those um, with what we're gonna be talking about. Great. Um, and of course, I like to preface all of my presentations with these three key themes. If you've been with me for the past two other times, this is a repetition, but just to remind you, um, I like to frame all of my talks with the three keys of comfort, knowledge, and awareness. Comfort is the goal. You should be comfortable on your ride. You should have comfortable clothing. You should be in comfortable weather. Um, and again, doesn't necessarily mean easy because I want you to have a strenuous ride if you're looking to get exercise, but I also want you to have a fun ride. Um, and what we're gonna be talking about is the knowledge. This is the front of the consciousness issues that come up in these presentations, which help make your ride become more comfortable. And then awareness, that's just my general catch-all of being a very zen in the moment rider. Biking again is a very five, six, seven senses, all engaged all at once. You have to be aware of your surroundings, aware of your body, aware of your perception, um, aware of your limitations, and everybody's different. So awareness is absolutely key to making sure that your ride is safe and um, happy. 
Cool. So let's jump into the meat of the presentation. Um, we showed this slide about two presentations ago, but I wanted to remind you that though you will have a bike, um, you're always going to need some basic equipment. We talked a little bit last week about some of the key points um, that might be particular to older adults, including glasses um, to protect the eyes, gloves to protect the hands. All that stuff is pretty basic, but the must-have, must-haves, generally, if you're riding in an urban environment, you should always have a helmet. The helmet needs to be in good condition, um, which means that they can't have any cracks in it, cannot have taken a fall. Um, where it's been used. Essentially, if your helmet has been struck, it is compromised. If your helmet is about five years old or more, you should probably get a new one because the styrofoam on a helmet does wear out. And there will be a, I don't have my helmet handy, but there will be a sticker on the inside of your helmet generally that tells you when the helmet was manufactured. Um, but you wanna make sure it's in good condition. Um, and then you want to make sure you're wearing it properly. A lot of folks might not realize that the helmet slides back when they're riding based off wind, based off the straps. And so typically you're just kind of sliding your helmet back over so that you're covering your forehead. Little things like that will go a long way. Um, you're going to want lights. Sometimes you can use lights uh, if they're strong enough for daytime riding as well. There's nothing wrong about having lights on during the day to make yourself more visible. Um, but you should always, always, always to be legal and to be safe, have lights on at night. Um, we'll talk about locking up in a second. You're going to need a sturdy bike lock. Wherever you're arriving, be it a coffee shop, a bookstore, whatever it is, you're going to need a bike lock. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about locking the wheels. If you're so concerned about losing a wheel, it does happen on occasion. Nothing to be so, so concerned about, but um, we'll talk about how to lock a bike. And then um, mirrors, um, definitely would recommend sunglasses or clear glasses to protect the eyes from any debris, but then mirrors are also very handy, especially if you have limitations on your neck and your um, shoulder movements. If you're gonna be turning back quite frequently, it's handy to have a mirror as an extra guide point to see what's coming from behind you. And then in COVID times, a face cover. So just standard stuff. Um, some other stuff that you might want to think about in um, terms of riding just around town is having an emergency kit with you. So this can be a little bit particular to the person, but um, in order to carry stuff, you're going to need to have some sort of carrying mechanism. So a basket, a rack. Um, you probably have seen this where there's the milk crate that's probably bungee corded on the back um, a rack of a bike, we call that the Cambridge crate. It is uh, basically a, a well-known um, cheater tool to get a free basket in the back of your bike, but whatever works. Um, if you're okay with a backpack, I don't necessarily recommend a backpack because it could limit your mobility, but if it's a small backpack and it's up to you, everything's up to you, um, you probably wanna be concerned about medication. So um, depending on um, the needs of the person, um, you know, I for one have like a little bit of a heart murmur. So I have heart medication that I take sometimes that if I was more concerned about that on a strenuous ride, I might have that on me just in case something were to come up. You can imagine if you get a mechanical problem and you're outside the city, or if you're in a crash um, and you need to go to the hospital, um, on occasion, that does happen to some folks, you wanna make sure that your medical history and your medicines as you need them, if they are crucial to you, are with you. And you might wanna think about along those lines, a first aid kit as well. I'd say that's a little bit secondary to the person. Um, you could have a general basic first aid kit. Um, whenever we're on group rides though, of course, we always carry a first aid kit on the rare occasion that somebody does tip over or have a crash. If there is a surface wound or something that we could just bandage up right there, no problem, um, we got that. Would highly recommend having a source of food and water. Um, we talked a little bit um, prior about the idea of bonking and bonking is the concept of when you lose your calories, when you're kind of just out of nutrition, um, you really need to make sure that you are hydrated and that you have enough electrolytes, enough sugar, enough salt in your body, because you are in a strenuous physical activity, even though it might feel fun, feel comfortable, be low impact, you have to make sure that 
if you start to notice that your um, reaction times slow down, that you become more frustrated, um, that you are a little more aggravated out there, I guarantee you the first line of defense is to drink some water and eat a little bit of food. And almost like magic, although it's not magic, it's basic physiology, um, you come back to life. And so keep that in mind, even on short, short trips, even on a, a mile or two around town, it's always handy to have water and a little bit of a snack. Um, you should always have your phone on you with your contact info, either on your phone, taped to it or nearby. Um, especially if you're ever in a crash, um, you need to go to the hospital, you need to contact an EMT, um, or you know there are other um, ways of having a contact info on you. Some people have a wristband, there's something called Road ID which is really nice that some cyclists have that at least has your name, date of birth, um, some basic medical information on it. I'm sure you're all familiar with this concept, but that's handy to have if you're ever out riding. Um, and then because we're in New England, the weather changes rapidly, especially in the fall and the spring of the shoulder seasons, having an extra layer can really make your ride happy. Um, you can take the layer off if you get heated, you can put the layer back on, but having an extra layer as part of your quote emergency kit does go a long way. So thinking about some of this stuff in advance is uh, a way to make sure that your ride remains comfortable and then you'll have this emergency kit when you're ready to roll. Cool. Um, if there's more things that you might wanna add to your emergency kit, I highly encourage you to let us know. Maybe we could talk about it after the presentation, some tips and tricks that you would recommend. Um, I could always add to this slide for a future presentation uh, we can talk about it. So feel free to add in the chat if there's anything else that you would want to have with you on your ride, separate from the helmet, lights, lock, um, and face cover. What would be particular that would make or break your ride? Cool. And just a quick thing to add there. Um, I think Galen talked about some ways which you could, um, you know, add a rack or baskets to your bike. Um, they also have Velcro on um, bags for your bike as well. One that sits in between um, the main triangle of your bike is a frame bag. And then you can get a little bag that Velcros onto your handlebars too. So even if your bike doesn't have the ability to have a rack or um, if that's um, not something that you want to add, um, the great thing about actually, and also there's another one that Velcros right underneath your seat um, and hangs from the, the bars that your seat is, the rails that your seat is mounted on. Um, so those are really awesome sort of like, you can quickly add them to your bike and take them off, especially if you're worried about leaving your bike somewhere and having that emergency kit in there. So um, just keep that in mind. You don't need to necessarily have a rack on your bike and not all bikes have the ability to have a rack on them. Although there are some modifications that you can make. Yeah, that's a very good point, Andy. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, we're not gonna talk too much about bike specifics, but um, your bike will have a particular way to add um, some sort of carrying capacity that's particular for your bike. So I recommend working with a bike shop to figure out the best mechanism. Um, for instance, the bike here that we're showing has a rear rack added to it. And then the baskets are put on that rear rack. In order to do that, you need a couple of bolts and an Allen wrench. And if you don't have that, if you don't have the know-how, which a lot of people don't, the bike shop can also help you figure out the best way to add your um, some carrying capacity. And not every bike can fit all the different types of racks. So it really is particular to your bike. Um, but that's just something to keep in mind, especially if you're looking to, you know, go buy a bike or buy a used bike. Think about, okay, how, where on this bike would I be able to add some sort of carrying cargo, either on the front basket, which might not need anything, might just hang there, or on the rear, which might require some eyelets mm -hmm. in the frame in order to, to screw it in. Or you get a particular rack that has different type of brackets for mounting. So. Um, Galen, if if I might add, you mentioned yeah. you yeah you mentioned weather, and if, if a person who's going to use the bicycle for uh, transportation, um, 
should should have fenders on the bicycle so that the really schmutzy, dirty stuff from the street doesn't come up at them. And then there are several different ways to have um, clothing that um, protect you from the cleaner water that comes down. Oh, you're getting there. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Very yeah, good. Thanks. I didn't. I didn't have on my slide fenders, so that was a good one. Um, so fenders are basically little covers around the wheels that are like mud flaps. So you don't kick mud up on yourself. Um, that's, a, that's a really important one, especially if you're going to be riding in, in the rain or the snow. Um, but, uh, but thanks, John. I appreciate that. Feel free to, to jump on in. Um, for clothing, what to wear. I mean, frankly, wear whatever's comfortable. There's no real defined... Um, must. But here are some tips. Um, you don't need to wear spandex or lycra, but you might want to. Um, you should avoid things that are very flowy. Um, you can ride in a dress if you do so wish. I've been known to do it, but the idea of it could get caught in the wheels or in the spokes, um, that's just something to keep in mind. So, you know, just make sure that anything that's flowy or um, potentially gonna get in the chain or the rotational system of a bike that you're just a little more cautious. Um, I do recommend my rule of planning 10 minutes into the ride. And what I mean to say there is that when you leave your house, you need to think, where will I be in 10 minutes? Um, will I have climbed a hill? Um, will I be more heated? Because remember, you're burning calories when you're riding. So you're going to heat up. And actually a lot of riders, especially newer riders, um, they over bundle, especially this time of year. And they don't realize how easy it is to overheat. You know, everybody's got different metabolism. I run a little warmer. Um, so once I start riding, I heat up pretty quickly. Um, so I generally leave the house cold and I warm up into my clothes. Um, in order to do that though, you have to kind of look at the weather and know your body but then also know your clothing. So I will have layers that I could take off when I get heated and that's no problem. I'll pull over and take off a base layer um, or maybe unzip and some bike uh, gear has zippers in the armpits to allow for ventilation, which is really nice. Um, some have zippers in the back, which allow for ventilation. Every clothing's a little bit different, um, but plan to warm up into your clothing. Um, I do recommend carrying extra layers, especially for um, the fall season, having an outer layer that is windproof and waterproof um, so that you can kind of have a shell and to making sure that your outermost layer is bright and visible. Um, having a neon green, uh, bright orange really goes a long way in making your ride or making yourself more visible and safer when you're out there. Um, and then, you know, keep in mind, like to John's point, that if you're in inclement weather, if you're in the rain, you can have modifications to your bike, like fenders, um, or just making sure that you're wearing waterproofs. You can have waterproof gloves. Um, you can have a, a little cap under your helmet. Uh, a raincoat that's bright yellow goes a long way. I ride in galoshes in the snow. Um, I ride in boots in the snow. So everybody's a little bit different. And I'm sure you've all been through many a New England weather up. Uh, uh, winter weather. So use your best judgment. But again, you know, frankly, there's, there's nothing to stop you if you're comfortable riding in what you're riding in. That's great. Um, how to lock your bike. So this is key when riding in an urban area that, uh, well, maybe I'll give it away, but um, why is that photo improperly locked? What is wrong with that Linus, that black step through Linus frame? is that only the front wheel is locked to the rack. So a bike thief can come with a wrench, arguably they have to have a wrench, but a wrenches are easy to come by, remove that front wheel and they've stolen the rest of your bike. So what I'm gonna ask you to do is keep in mind, you have to lock that triangle of the frame itself to the fixed object. Now, please, 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 when you're finding a place to park, I need you to find a bike rack and that could be a corral on the street, or that could be a sighted bike parking rack um, somewhere in the city of Cambridge. Now, if you park elsewhere than a bike rack, you run the risk of blocking the sidewalk, blocking traffic, 
blocking folks who are in a wheelchair or with a stroller or with groceries. You run the risk of blocking a fire exit. I mean, there's some serious ramifications um, and I'm sure we've all been out there when we've been walking on the sidewalk and um, improperly locked bicycle has tipped over and has blocked the way. Um, so whenever you are parking, make sure you are finding a sighted, safe um, bike parking official rack. If there isn't one around, then do your best to find a way to get, you know, something that is not necessarily a light pole or a bus stop shelter or a handicap access pole. Um, but ideally, you know, even if you have to walk a block to your destination, it's okay. It's totally fine. You don't need to park immediately at the front door, but please, please, please find a bike rack. Um, there's a lot we can talk about for bike parking. I can come and do it if there's any questions about where in the city um, we have a lot of bike parking, but you'll see a lot of the on-street corrals in the heavily um, trafficked areas as well. Uh, multimodal commuting. And by this, I mean combining your bike trip with a MBTA or shuttle bus. Now, I do say that 100% of MBTA buses have bike racks, and that's actually wrong. I take that back. I realized that the buses that go through tunnels, such as the Silver Line 1 and 2, do not have bike racks on the front. And some of the buses that go through Harvard Square that utilize the um, electrical wire system also do not have bike racks. So I should take that slide and, and modify it, but my apologies with that. Um, but the majority, the far, far majority of, bu of buses that are able to have racks do have racks. Now, getting to know those racks, could be a little bit more of a challenge. So if you've never used the bike racks on a bus, please check out mbta.com slash bikes. They have a wonderful video on how to utilize the racks. But the cool thing about it is that you don't need to bike the entire way or both ways. You can take the bus to a destination. <laughs> um, you can take a train to a destination. Um, you can take a ferry to a destination and then ride around from there. Um, Mass Bike does work with the MBTA. We've successfully advocated recently that all commuter rail trains, regardless of the time, do allow bikes on the trains. Now, this is particular to COVID because ridership is so low, but if you wanted to go out, leave the city, you can take a commuter rail train at any time of day. There's no restrictions on taking your bike. However, if you're taking the subway, if you're taking the T, there are limitations on the commuter hours. You cannot take your bike between the hours of, of uh, seven and 10 in the morning and four and seven in the evening because there is still a commuter rush. Now the commuter wow. rail, you can take your bike anytime, which is great. And that's new, that's as of last week, but uh, know that the T still does have limitations. And if you're um, thinking about doing it, check out the website. Galen, uh, Galen, I could add, I once got on the on the train and rode all the way out to Fitchburg. And it's, it's incredibly cheap if you're riding outside the uh, urban area and opposite the direction of, of the rush hour. So, I, you know, I got out to Fitchburg and then I rode the rest of the way to Northfield, which turned an 80-mile trip into a 40-mile trip. And it, it was really great. These are you can you can use the T for that kind of of uh, getting out of the city. Yeah, yeah, and there's some wonderful rail trails that are outside the city. Um, you might want to check out the Bruce Freeman Rail Trail. You might want to go out to Waltham and ride along the Blue Heron Pathway. So there are ways to go riding on uh, our beautiful New England Pathway system far outside of the city of Cambridge by utilizing the trains. Cool. Um, I'll bring up the bike map. Um, so for the rest of the presentation, for about 20 minutes or so, we're going to talk about um, riding in traffic. And it's going to be a lot of information, so bear with me. Um, but again, the reason that I invited John here is because there are resources to follow up with. Um, and AD and myself can help you if you have any further questions about getting some more resources about riding in the streets. Uh, but because we're talking about the city of Cambridge, I'm going to utilize the City of Cambridge bicycle map. And what I want you to pay attention to on this map is that there are a lot of off street or adjacent pathways that remove you from traffic, but they don't go everywhere. So if you're going to be riding in the city, you will have to be comfortable riding in some type of traffic. Now, it doesn't have to be on Mass Ave during rush hour, but 
we'll talk about some tips and tricks about thinking of yourself of riding in traffic. Um, some- uh, Kaylin, just to jump in really quickly, we had a couple questions um, about, um, does the commuter rail still have a $10 uh, weekend pass? Um, and they do, yeah. um, so that's pretty cool. And then we had another question about where do you put your bike on the um, commuter rail? And um, so usually it's right inside the entryway, they'll have um, a place to put bikes. Um, it's a, a lot of times they'll also put it in the section where um, the seats are folded up. So sometimes it's like a handicap access area, um, but um, if, there are no, if there's no one using that, sometimes they'll put bikes in there and they're pretty accommodating. I've seen um, like at times, uh, bikes loaded into the seats <laughs> when there was a lot of people using the commuter rail. Um, and the only thing about the commuter rail is I would urge you to um, look at access points where um, if you have concerns about being able to lift your bike, um, checking to make sure that um, there's elevator access um, and platform access so that you don't have to lift your bikes. Um, however, a lot of times the um, uh, staff will help you, so. Yeah, that's actually a really, really important point. Thanks for bringing that up, AD. There are some stations that are not handicap accessible. Um, unfortunately, we're working on it, but like if you get off at Newtonville or Natick, there are stairs that you have to go up and they're not friendly stairs. So plan your trip accordingly to make sure that there are level boarding platforms so you can just roll your bike right off. Um, most modern stations are like that, but not all of our system is modern. Um, but it's a few key ones that I'd recommend you check out. Salem is an awesome place to go ride around. If you've never ridden around Salem, although wait until after Halloween, don't go now. I should take that back. Um, uh, where else to go? Worcester. Um, there's some beautiful riding around the city of Worcester, if you're so inclined. And the Union Station there is a really cool little spot to go um, check out. Um, when um, Providence, I know it's a long way down to Rhode Island, but you can get on the East Bay bike path, which is a 30 mile pathway that goes all the way down along the Narragansett um, Bay, which is absolutely gorgeous. So um, finding some places outside the city is, is really inspiring. Cool. Um, oh, here's the map. I'm sure you've seen it. Um, but what's very important to think about whenever you're riding in the city are basically the uh, traffic laws and safety tips. And so we'll talk about that for the next you know, 15 minutes or so. Um, general principles are that when you're riding a bike, you need to think of yourself as if you were driving a vehicle and the same, for the most part, the same rights and responsibilities that other drivers have to obey, um, you will as well. So that means all traffic laws. Um, and it's important to recognize that it's not necessarily for the law. Like I don't think a Cambridge police officer, I mean, they might give you a ticket, but it's really for your own safety. So everything that we're gonna be talking about coming forward is um, you know, a bit about the legal aspect, but more so it's about the principles of traffic so that you remain safe out there. And I will caveat by all this by saying that if at any point you feel unsafe on the roadways, it's okay to ride on the sidewalk as long as you're not in a business district, which means in Cambridge, if you're not in a square, if you're not in Porter Square, Harvard Square, Central Square, Kendall Square, you can ride on the sidewalks in any residential area for the most part, 99% of them throughout the entire Commonwealth. However, there are limitations to riding on the sidewalk, which we'll cover shortly. Um, and it might be safer to walk your bike just the same. But I wanna emphasize that if at any point you do not feel safe on the roads, you don't need to be out there. There are alternatives and you can always hop off your bike and become a pedestrian and don't not be in a tricky situation. So what are some of these? Oh, oh, and then there's considerations for older adults. So though I want you to think about driving a vehicle when you're out there, I want you to also think about some limitations, um, which again, this is just a, 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 um, a few, but you might wanna add to this as well. Um, for older adults, which we touched on briefly in the last week's presentation, 
but some of the key points to remember as we go forward and talk about when you're in traffic. The first one is your peripheral vision. Um, keep in mind your eyes um, might not necessarily catch everything that's on the sides, especially if you're in glasses um, or have limited vision, which might change your response time. So all of that plays into how uh, much you can rely on um, the responses of traffic and the patterns of traffic. You're gonna need to give yourself more time. And that means to stop, to change lanes, to make maneuvers. Um, the safest way to go sometimes is just to slow yourself down and give you more opportunities to maneuver. Um, you will need to be alert, kind of sometimes on a high alert in high traffic areas. You can choose which roads to ride on. Some are more stressful than others, but I want you to be aware of your alertness. And this comes down to the awareness portion of the comfort, knowledge, and awareness. If you are aware of how alert you are, aware of your response time, you're gonna have a safer ride. And then lastly, what happens if you have to stop in traffic, if there's an obstruction, if you just feel like, okay, this is, this is a lot, I just need to hop off my bike. How to handle that, frankly, is just to kind of pull over to the right just like a car would if they were, a car driver would if you were stopping when you were driving and just get out of the traffic and just totally fine to do that. Don't feel like you have to be in a situation where you are uncomfortable or feel like you are in danger. So just some more considerations. There's lots more that I probably could populate this slide with. So if there's anything that you think I'm missing here, please, please let us know in the chat, let us know via email or chime in after the talk because um, this is again, we're here for you. And, um, you know, arguably I'm not an older adult, so I'm trying to emphasize, empathize by putting myself in your shoes. But the best way to do that is to directly say, what am I missing here? So what are some considerations out there? I don't know, John, if there's anything that um, from your perspective, we could add to the slide. Uh, well, I, I can just say that, the, the, you know, these points are, are great, but there's really no substitute for um, studying the material, um, either by reading about it or by taking one of the courses that um, Mass Bike offers and Cycling Savvy offer, um, it will it transform the riding style of many people. Just they, you you have no idea what there is to learn until you actually get into one of these courses, mm -hmm. and it can't be. It can't be transmitted just by talking about it. You really have to practice it. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for that. Yeah, it's I, it's really hard to put on a slide. Um, thanks for that. <clears throat> so I'll put this one up for a second. I love this image. This is from Bikey Face. She's a local artist. Um, does some wonderful cartoons about biking. This is a convoluted image here, but the idea of what we're going to talk about is lane positioning. So sometimes, which is actually going to be next week's presentation, <clears throat> we'll talk about infrastructure, bike infrastructure, separated infrastructure, um, protected infrastructure, and all the rest. But like I mentioned at the beginning slide of the map, that infrastructure is not necessarily continuous to get everywhere you need to be, especially if you're leaving the city of Cambridge. So there will be points when you need to put yourself in traffic and be like a driver and consider that. So the idea of what you're gonna be thinking about is how to be predictable, how to be prominent, and how to be confident so that you are what we're known as claiming the lane. And if that's not comfortable for you, that's okay. You don't necessarily need to be on that particular road or in that particular area. But um, just to keep in mind that there will be times where when you are riding in traffic, you will be essentially in the lane. So let's talk about some considerations. And thanks, John, for mentioning that this really can't necessarily be transmitted via a PowerPoint presentation. So these are concepts to utilize when we actually go out and practice when we are riding. Um, when you are sharing a trail on a sidewalk, so a couple of things to think about here. The main one is that you are less visible. Less visible to drivers as they're pulling out of driveways, less visible because there might be a shrubbery or landscaping that block it that haven't been cited by traffic engineers and less visible because drivers might not be expecting you. So if you're ever honest on a trail or a sidewalk, just keep in mind that drivers might not be looking for you to be going that 10, 12 miles an hour. 
So take it very slow, especially if there are curb cuts and driveways. Um, when you are approaching an intersection, there's a couple of rules of principles of how to position yourself. And again, every intersection is different, especially in New England. But for the most part, a couple of uh, key philosophical points. The first is you should ride in the quote, rightmost lane for your direction of travel, which means that if you're on a multiple lane road, you need to make sure that the lane that you're in still follows the course that you want to go through the intersection. Secondly, you need to position yourself within that lane to prominently say that you are going in that direction. So the three biker diagram here, if you are going to the left, you need to be kind of on the left side of that lane. If you're going straight, position yourself more in the middle of that lane. And if you're towards the right, you can go, uh, or turning right, go towards the right side of the lane. It's just about forecasting where you are trying to go. Now, this is not comfortable for you because being out in front of traffic is tricky. I understand that, but this is just a principle to think about. I definitely recommend you communicate with eye contact, with hand signals. The key here is being predictable and being prominent so that you are visible. Um, along these lines, we'll go through a couple of key ones. <clears throat> you need to prominently place yourself in the direction of where you are trying to go in a way that you aren't squeezed out. So for instance, if I was that biker on the right and I was gonna be turning right, that's fine. But if I was positioning myself as far right as possible and there was a driver in a car who was also trying to go right, I would potentially put myself up for what's called the right hook. Talk about the right hook in a minute, but I wanna make sure that you are basically claiming the space that will require you to go in the direction you are trying to go so that you aren't kind of squeezed into a location of a lane where a driver assumes you're gonna go right because you're on the right-hand side of the road. But if you are going straight, that could lead to a conflict point. And I'll have a diagram on that in a second. And just to jump in there, um, I think one of uh, the mistakes that I see cyclists who are just getting out on the um, streets for the first time and maybe aren't very confident around traffic. One of the common mistakes I see is that um, they hug too far over to the curb or leave drivers too much space. Um, so one of the most important concepts I think for urban cycling is being comfortable taking up space uh, in the travel lane and just on the road in general. So um, it's far better to position yourself in the middle of the lane um, in some cases than to hug all the way over to get yourself out of the way of vehicles. A lot of times putting yourself a little bit more prominently in the lane is actually much safer um, because all of a sudden you become a consideration to drivers. Whereas before, um, I think they just don't necessarily take you into account. Yeah, yeah, very key. And it, it is a good principle of traffic that slower traffic is generally on the right side of the road, just the way traffic works. And you are slower traffic when you are riding a bike. However, you also need to position yourself that when you go through an intersection, you are in the prominent place so that you can continue in that direction that you're trying to go. Um, and again, every intersection is different. So some key considerations just to think about so that you can make your own judgment call. Um, <clears throat> multiple turn lanes become a little tricky. So if there's a double left turn lane, for instance, you're gonna to wanna to be in again, that rightmost lane for the direction of travel. It's a very wonky way of putting it, but basically say, if you are going in the direction that the travel is going, make sure that if there's multiple options that you're in that rightmost option. So here's an example, if you're turning left to multiple left turn lanes. If you're in that position though, just be wary because you are very vulnerable out there. You are not surrounded by steel and airbags. Um, we'll talk in a minute about ways of making left turns, but if you are considering yourself to be part of traffic, this is how traffic would maneuver. Um, I have a couple more options for left turns in a minute, which are particular to bicyclists, but if you are gonna be um, operating like a motorist would, this is a consideration of ways to do a multiple left turn lane. And again, every intersection is different, so don't necessarily think that you have to do it this way, but these are just food for thought. 
Um, one way street with multiple lanes, um, prominently place yourself within that lane. So if you're gonna say go left, and again, lefts are tricky, you wanna be in that left lane. But if you're going straight, you're gonna to wanna to be in the right lane because slower traffic, like a bicyclist, needs to be towards the right side of the road. Now, if there's an obstruction, you need to merge, that's totally fine. But in order to do so, we're gonna remember how to do scanning. We talked about scanning last week, about turning your head back and seeing what's behind you. Um, make sure that you're comfortable and capable of doing scanning before you're gonna hop out at a multiple lane road because you're gonna to need to scan of what's coming in order to change your direction safely. Bike lanes can be tricky and we'll cover this much more intensely next week. But the key thing about bike lanes is that for the most part, eventually you will need to leave the bike lane. And that becomes tricky and sometimes a conflict point. Sometimes the bike lane stops and it merges with a turn lane or merges with traffic. Sometimes the bike lane is in what's called the door zone of a parked car that has opened the door so the driver or the passenger can get out and you might need to leave the bike lane. In order to feel comfortable in a bike lane, you also need to feel comfortable in traffic because unfortunately bike lanes are not protected everywhere yet. We're working on it. But if you're gonna to choose to ride in a bike lane, you will also need to feel comfortable in traffic. It's kind of one of those dual issues where we're trying to advocate for as protected infrastructure as possible, but until we get that everywhere, it's a mix of being comfortable riding in traffic as well as being comfortable riding in a protected lane. So some considerations and stay tuned for next week when we talk much more intensely about the types of bike lanes in the city of Cambridge, because there's a variety of them and they change almost on a daily basis. So there's a lot of considerations around bike lanes. Uh, Galen, may I add, um, Please. The, the idea of riding in the middle of a, a travel lane may scare some people. This is where you need, need really to uh, study the material and practice because it turns out that riding way over at the edge and getting buzzed on uh, being out of where people look for you and possibly getting doored are way more dangerous than riding in the lane as shown in, in this picture. Um, also, um, a very useful tool to make this even, uh, you know, to improve your confidence is a rear view mirror. Um, uh, I use one, it helps me scope out what's happening behind me and how to prepare for lane changes and turns. But it also just looking back there, I can say, hey, nothing's happening. That car's following me at a safe distance, fine. Mm -hmm. Yep, great. And then I'll also caution though, mirrors are great, but they're not 100% because they do have blind spots. Absolutely. So, yeah, so even if you have a mirror, you're also need to train yourself on being able to use your peripheral vision to triple check. Right. Good call. Um, and then on bike lanes, uh, bike lanes become tricky when you approach intersections because bike lanes don't go through intersections. It just means that there is a crossover between travel lanes, um, whether it's a turn lane or opposite direction traffic. Um, keep that in mind. Now we're making uh, definitely some headway into making bike lanes more prominent via green paint more prominent markers, but they're new. Um, and I will say that the city of Boston didn't get its first bike lane until 2008. So it's only been a little bit more than a decade that we've even been talking about bike lanes in Boston. Cambridge a little bit longer. I think Cambridge got their first bike lane in the late seventies around Garden Street, but it's been hit or miss. And if you go someplace like Malden, um, up in Medford, bike lanes are uh, sparse and hard to find. So don't necessarily think that um, what you're familiar with in Harvard Square is the standard. It is the exception these days. And again, we'll talk a little bit more about that um, next week. Um, but one other consideration I want to throw in here, particular for New England, are rotaries. And rotaries or roundabouts sometimes are really tricky. Um, so my real recommendation here is to hop off your bike and walk in the crosswalks of rotaries. If you do want to go, and ride in a rotary, you are within your rights and responsibilities, you are able to legally, but it might be a tricky idea. So if you're by Fresh Pond, for instance, um, there's a bunch of nasty rotaries on Route 16 that frankly, I hop off my bike and walk it 
and that's totally fine. So, um, you know, you can navigate it like a motors would, but I guarantee the bike infrastructure does not go through the rotary. So it just becomes a little bit tricky and, you know, becoming a pedestrian might be the safest way of doing things. That's easy. Um, Mass DOT do um, update their guidelines quite regularly. They just came out literally last week with a new roundabout guidelines about how to do biking and walking infrastructure in a roundabout and a rotary. Um, it's an engineering design guideline that is, you know, it's set now as to every design in the future will take into account biking and walking. But every rotary up until last week throughout the state probably has no infrastructure for bicyclists. Um, but there probably is some way to get a pedestrian across. So walking is a totally fine way of navigating some of these tricky areas. Cool. Um, I've got about five more slides just to cover some tips and tricks about some car and bike incidents. I'm gonna fly through these. My apologies if this gets a little dense, we can cover these again um, next week. And I'm also happy to answer some more questions, but this is just to prime the pump of some considerations around crashes and how to avoid them. The very first thing to keep in mind is that the safest way to get um, through an intersection is to follow the lights. Stop at the reds, go on the greens. Please, 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 I don't care if you see other cyclists cutting through, don't go. Even if it's a pedestrian signalization, legally, you have to stop. You can always walk your bike, um, but just, just keep in mind that um, the light infrastructure is for you since you are also traffic. Should also keep in mind your hand signals. Um, if you are comfortable and you feel it is safe to do so, practice your hand signals. And this is something that we would do in person on bike. We would be biking away. You'd be using your hand signals, making sure that you aren't wobbling, making sure that you can still shift, making sure that you can still break while taking a hand off the handlebars. If that is an unsafe maneuver, legally, you are not required to uh, hand signal, but it is a very strong recommendation under state law to say that you should signal if it is safe. But again, if it's unsafe for you to take a hand off the handlebars, we don't want you to crash while you're signaling. Um, there's particular things that we would get uh, in practice on bike, such as signaling before you turn, not during the turn, and get familiar with signaling, looking back, signaling, looking back before you turn. So it's a little bit of that habitualization of learning how to signal, getting familiar with the muscles of turning before you make the maneuver. Um, okay. But the key things here are left turns, the left arm straight out, a right turn could be a right arm straight up or a right hand out and then stopping and slowing down is like this. But the most important is the left arm out as a signal to drivers that you need the space to make a left maneuver. Um, Galen, if I may add, uh, the, the, the right arm straight out really, it, it shows what you're doing. The other one I call the Saturday night fever right turn signal. But also that the, the it, um, important point you made is that you signal before you turn the signal from a bicyclist is not just a, I'm going to do that. It's a request. Mm -hmm. It's a request to the driver behind you to slow down or change lanes and make room for you. And it has to be accompanied by checking that the driver actually did that. That's what makes you safe. Mm -hmm. Yep. Using that eye contact, looking back and checking before you change directions. Because I don't want you to cross traffic assuming anything. You really have to know. Okay, right. a few tips. First one, we talked about it before, ride with traffic. Bikes are traffic. Don't go the wrong way. Um, and a lot of this, this is a convoluted slide as well. My apologies for making it a little complex, but drivers are only looking where they're expecting you. And they're not gonna be looking the other direction before they pull out. So driver A is not gonna be looking for wrong way bicyclists. Go with traffic, this is basic. This is why bike lanes are important because they train bicyclists to ride with the direction of traffic and to be generally on the right-hand side of the road. A little bit less intuitive is to choose your line and hold your line. The safest way to ride is predictably. So find a spot on the lane where you can maintain a course 
And I hopefully, you know, there's not a pothole or you need to maneuver around it. If you do need to um, maneuver around an obstacle, that's what the signals are for and the scanning and the looking, but try to ride as straight as possible. That is the safest way to ride. And you've all, I'm sure, seen either as a passenger or a driver in a car, when a bicyclist is weaving, that's when it's the most unsafe. So as a bicyclist, try to ride as predictably as possible. Now, when you are holding that line, make sure that line is out of the door zone. This is absolutely key especially as a lot of bike lanes are in the door zone because they are wedged between the parked cars and the moving traffic. It's unfortunate, but we're working on changing the guidelines on bike lanes because this is arguably an older um, engineering standard that we're hopefully trying to get away from. But if you are finding yourself in the door zone, ride more in the travel lane which is less intuitive and might be intimidating, but you have no requirement to ride in a bike lane. As a bicyclist, you are legally allowed, if it's safe to do so, to ride in a travel lane, and that's fine. Now that means you have to negotiate the space with the drivers because you are sharing the space as opposed to being next to it, but don't, don't, don't put yourself in a position where somebody might just open up a door and strike you. It is illegal to open a door and strike somebody. So if that ever happens, please get a police officer on the scene to cite whomever opened the door so there can be a designation of fault. That is very important if you ever need to claim legal damages, insurance damages, or anything else. It is a citable offense for whomever opened the door. I don't care if they're a passenger in a Lyft or an Uber or if they didn't see you or if they're very apologetic. Um, it is illegal to do so. And we fought very hard for that law. Um, but more so just not putting yourself in that situation is the best way of avoiding getting hurt. So just don't ride in that door zone, which means unfortunately a bike lane is about five feet wide, parked cars, moving travel, five feet of a bike lane. Um, a car door is about three to four feet wide but yet the middle of your bike to the edge of your handlebar is about 12 inches. So if you add up the car door space and the width of the bike, you really, th this image here of the green and red might even be a little bit too generous for the bike lane. The safest place to ride might even be on that far edge of that white lane. So though we have bike lanes more or less on the streets, it might not be safe to ride in the bike lane and there is no requirement for you to do so. You need to do what is safest for you in that moment. And sometimes that means riding in that edge, that white edge closer to the travel lanes or sometimes even outside of the bike lane. And though it may feel intimidating, it might be safer because drivers behind you see you. The person opening that car door does not see you and is not looking for you. So you need to be where you are most visible and predictable. And unfortunately, people opening the door do not necessarily see you. And this is absolutely key because this is a very common and arguably a very serious crash. Um, it's not necessarily um, frequent. Um, however, there was a fatal crash in Inman Square about three years ago that involved a woman being struck by an opening door um, and I, I hate to say it's sad, but she was thrown into moving traffic. Um, it's not very common. It was one incident three years ago. However, there's lots of more minor incidents about what we call dooring. So the safest way to not get doored is to not be in the door zone. It's not your fault as a bicyclist, but that's not the point. The point is to avoid the crash at all. Similarly, the safest way to not get right hooked, sadly enough, is to not be in the right hook zone. Again, not a bicyclist's fault, but at intersections, if you are ever parallel to moving traffic, it is absolutely key that you don't put yourself next to a large vehicle with blind spots where drivers might not see you. I have another slide that shows blind spots in a second, but um, arguably the most severe of the crashes take place at right hook spots around buses, trucks, 
garbage trucks, semi trucks, tractor trailers um, with the right hook. So the key here is if you are approaching an intersection and you are in mixed traffic, you need to make sure that you are not parallel to a moving vehicle. And so if I were this bicyclist, if I were this blue bicyclist approaching this intersection, what I would do is I would signal, throw my hand out, I would scan by looking back uh, the driver in the blue car, and I would actually merge to put myself in line with the beige car and the blue car. I would be behind the beige car, so if that beige car was gonna make that turn, I wouldn't be anywhere near a zone where I could be struck and I would be more prominently spotted in front of the driver of the blue car so that there wasn't the opportunity for the blue car to try to pass me, either to make a turn or to obstruct me from being visible in the, as I approach an intersection. But again, this requires confidence, this requires comfort. So if you're not comfortable in a situation like this, I might say pulling over and walking is fine, or finding a different road to ride on is also totally fine. But at an intersection with multiple lanes, you need to take this into consideration. It might be safer not to even be in that spot. Galen, uh, this is with moving traffic and there's a, a great temptation and often it's safe to filter forward slowly to the right of stopped traffic in a bike lane. But my rule is never pass the first car because you don't know which way it's going to turn. People don't always use their signals. Mm -hmm. If you wait behind the first car, the driver of the second is, is where you're where the driver of the second car can see you and you can negotiate your way safely uh, ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Matt. It's all about negotiation and it's all about friendly negotiation. And when I say hand signals, I mean the good kind of hand signals not the bad kind of things. <laughs> so it is all about making eye contact and communication. Um, and particularly serious and severe is around tractor trailers and buses. You might not realize that on the right side of, and really frankly on the left side and in the back and in the front of these large vehicles, there is a severe blind spot. Um, this is something that as a cyclist, you might not understand because you have a 360 degree view of the world. Drivers do not. You might just not show up at all. If you are ever parallel to a large vehicle, be wary. As you approach an intersection, my recommendation is to tap your brakes and get behind them. If you are behind them out of the zone, you, one, you won't be in a blind spot, and two, if they do start to make a maneuver, you can have the space and the time to not put yourself in that precarious position. Again, it's not your fault, but the idea is to remove yourself from that dangerous scenario. Um, tractor trailers as well, you might not be realizing that as they make a right turn, they actually go to the left in order to swing to the right to get their cab fully around the curve. So what might look like a tractor trailer merging into the left lane might be them maneuvering to make a right turn. If you are on a street with tractor trailers, avoid them. Frankly, stay away from them. Um, and that's a lot, of, uh, a lot of, of information a lot of cyclists don't really realize because they think that as, as a cyclist that they have the rights to be there, which they do, but that's besides the point. And if this is intimidating, you can ride on roads that are not truck routes. So you can ride on Green Street and not Mass Ave. You can ride on Bishop Allen and not Mass Ave. You can ride on a Harvard Street and not Broadway and not Mass Ave and get around truck and bus routes. But if you find yourself on the major arterials, just so you know, you're fine to be out there if you're comfortable, but be extra, extra cautious when you're approaching an intersection if there is a large vehicle. And the best way to maneuver is to just stay back and give the space and give the time for the driver to do their maneuver. Cool. And then lastly, my last recommendation here is on left turns. So these are key. What I like to say, um, it, it really depends on the intersection, but I like to go for what's called the box turn or the two stage left, which is kind of the middle diagram here. So as a left turn, it can be very tricky. Um, you can maneuver just like a motorist would, 
which means merging into the left lane and when it's clear, making that left, just like that first diagram has it here. Or on a really tricky intersection, like the third diagram, you can always hop off your bike and walk it, use the crosswalk, no problem. But I like to do what's called the two-stage left, which um, arguably is becoming more and more common with the infrastructure that you're seeing out there. So what happens with the two-stage left is you basically have a little pocket with which you can wait without having to cross over travel lanes. Now, these photographs on the right were actually taken on Binney Street um, in Cambridge in um, the Kendall Square, East Cambridge area. And the idea is that as a cyclist, you're going straight through an intersection, um, but instead of going all the way straight, you kind of go part of the way, pull over, turn your bike, turn your body, so that as opposed to going in a left motion and crossing over travel lanes, you're really going straight, waiting for the light cycle to change, and then you're going straight through again, so you're not having to cross over any moving travel you're basically making two straight maneuvers as opposed to making a left maneuver. And that is what these little small little bike box symbols of the painted green with the bike symbol mean. Um, it's not common knowledge yet. These are very new. Only in the past couple of years has these even started to pop up in a bike friendly city like Cambridge. And these are not standardized throughout the state just yet. We're working on it. We're getting it into the RMV manual, but that's only for new drivers. So drivers who have been driving for decades have no idea what these are. So again, the idea though, is to take yourself as a cyclist out of the vulnerable position. Because if you were um, this diagram here, if you were moving like a motorist, you're really kind of in the middle of an intersection without any protection. So the idea of the bike box left turn is to take yourself out of that vulnerable spot and then wait for the light cycle to change so that you can continue in your motion where you're trying to go without having that danger of crossing moving traffic. And you can do this even if there is no bike box, even if there is no green infrastructure, even if there is no bike lane, just like you would staying to the right, you can kind of pull over kind of either in a crosswalk area or ahead of that first car area and just position yourself so that when the light changes, you're ready to roll. And that's totally fine. You can do it at a stop sign, you can do it at a red light. You can do it at any intersection where you might feel unsafe or tricky having to make a left turn like a motorist would. Totally fine, totally legal. In fact, it's encouraged. I do this for the majority of my left turns. So with that, that was a lot to throw at you. We're gonna talk a lot next week about how to maneuver some of these new fangled bike lanes, some of the uh, considerations about what we're seeing out there. But I also wanna remind you that though we are talking about some of the trickier things, biking is still fun. Biking is still the best way to get around, the most efficient way to get around, the safest way to get around per mile, and actually best for your health, low impact, all those things we've already talked about. Um, but you gotta keep moving if you're gonna be doing it. So with that, um, I thank you for letting me go a little bit longer. I realize that we only have about 10 minutes left in our hour and a half to do some Q&A and some questions, but um, I want to thank John for chiming in and introducing us to Cycling Savvy. Um, John, are you okay if we share your slides with the group after the fact? Uh, sure, go ahead. Um, would you be, well, I'll ask you about details later. Excellent, yeah, and I'm um, I thank AD, and then if there's anything else to throw in here, AD, I'm happy to stop sharing my screen or I can keep this up for folks so they can take our contact info. But um, with that, I'm, uh, I'm grateful to have another opportunity to address you fine folks. And I look forward to next week's talk.